Richard Rick Chase would suffer from mental illness all his life. Within the span of one month, he would commit murder, necrophilia and cannibalism. Hi, my name is Anya. Welcome to my channel and thank you for being here. This video is a bit long with a lot of backstory. And if you are more impatient, there will be timestamps for you. So just click on those and skip ahead. Okay. Richard Rick Chase was born on the 23rd of May in 1950 in Santa Clara County, California, to parents Beatrice Chase and Richard Chase Sr. We will be referring to Richard Jr. as Rick, so we don't mix him up with his dad Richard. Already from birth, Rick would have a tough time. During labour, his mother Beatrice was volatile to his father Richard. She was said to have been highly paranoid and accusing her husband for getting her pregnant with his poison seed. She was convinced she would die in labour. When Rick's little head started to poke out, she clawed at him. When the ordeal was finally over, it was Richard who would be the one comforting little baby Rick. After leaving the hospital, Beatrice would continue with her odd behaviour, and living in a one-bedroom apartment with a baby did not help. The couple would argue daily. Beatrice accused Richard of cheating on her and was convinced he was trying to poison her. Richard had a bad temper. He would often hit his wife. Unfortunately for little Rick, he would spend all of his time with his paranoid mother and angry father. Although Richard didn't hit Rick, Rick would often watch his parents fight and argue. This had a huge impact on him. He became a quiet child and eventually started to wet the bed. When Rick was old enough to walk and talk, his mother often told him he was ill just like her. And being the young child he was, he obviously believed her. When Richard got home from work, he was inundated with hypochondria and paranoia. Beatrice would try to convince Richard to take Rick to the hospital on multiple occasions. This led to Richard getting angrier and he began to hit Rick. It happened on occasion that Rick, as a very young child, would help Beatrice pour out cleaning products down the drain because she said Richard was poisoning her with them. In 1954, when Rick was four years old, Beatrice got pregnant again. Richard had landed a new job with good pay. The job was located in Sacramento, California. And Richard hoped that this would be a new beginning for their little family. They moved into a three-bedroom house, but even if there was more room, the turmoil continued. For months, Beatrice would grow increasingly more unstable. The little romance between the couple was now completely gone, and she was convinced that Richard was cheating on her. The abuse and chaos continued. Rick didn't like loud noises or the yelling, but luckily now he had a bedroom where he could retreat away from everything and everyone, close the door and crawl under the blankets. At this point, he had almost stopped talking. Finally, Pamela was born in 1954. She was loved by Richard from day one. He doted on her and saw a chance to raise a normal child. He wanted Beatrice to implement a routine and good rules for the new baby. There was a clear change in the home. She took care of the house and seemed in a better mood. Rick was finally left alone by his mother, and with the newfound freedom, he explored his surroundings, mainly their yard and the forest behind their house. He went to school and the faculty liked him. He was a polite but a very quiet boy. He made friends and was a Cub Scout for about four years and played in Little League. His parents kept on cooing over the new baby. Rick kept on exploring the person he would unfortunately eventually become. When the family had lived in their new home for a few years, the neighborhood cats started to go missing. Nobody knew, but it was Rick taking these cats. He would take them to the forest beyond the house, torture them and play with the corpses. When uh, Rick was 10 years old, Beatrice caught him with a corpse of a cat. She ignored what she had seen. Some reports say she helped Rick to cover up the crime by burying the poor cat in her flower bench, but that's not confirmed. Regardless, she didn't tell Richard about Rick's alarming behaviour. Shortly after this, her paranoia kicked in again, and the normal life they displayed to the outside world began to crumble. 
Beatrice felt like she was stuck at home with her evil child, whilst Richard was out in the world cheating on her. She followed Richard to his place of work. She lurked around being all weird. People noticed this odd behavior and the fighting at home picked right back up again. Finally, Richard took his wife to see a psychiatrist. Meanwhile, Rick kept on hunting in the forest, catching birds and rabbits. He would open them up with a little knife and hurt them. He was fascinated by the squeals they made when he tormented them and how warm they felt on the inside. Later on, in his early teens, he would feel sexual arousal at the sadistic ritual. He grew more and more quiet in school, and the faculty would often smell something strange on him. It wasn't quite tobacco, but very similar. It was the smell of smoke. Rick had now started to obtain matches and lighting fires. He also used fire in the torturing of animals. Richard Rick Chase had now hit the trifecta, bedwetting, torturing animals, and setting fires. The help Beatrice had been given didn't work. She continued to lose her mind. However, now she was talking to the neighborhood about her abusive and cruel husband. Richard's employers weren't happy about the rumors, and Richard was fired. Financial hardship fell over the family, and eventually they lost their home. The family moved into an apartment. Rick hated living there. He couldn't set fires or torture animals away from the forest and his old backyard. At the age of 14, he attended Mira Vista High School. At some point, Beatrice didn't want to be married anymore, and uh, she took Rick and Pamela to live with their mother in L.A., In LA, her hypochondria got worse. She told Rick that the bones in his head looked strange. And he fed into the theory that his father had been poisoning his mother and that he himself had somehow ingested some of the poison. This is when he thought there was something wrong with his heart and claimed that he could feel it getting weaker. This would become a common theme in his life. The delusion that his heart was dying and that he lacked blood. In LA, the couple got back together and Rick went back to school. However, he didn't put in any effort anymore. His social life boomed. He had many different friend groups. Girls liked him very much and he started to feel what young people feel. He wanted to be intimate with a girl. He dated a girl called Libby. Unfortunately, when the time came to do the deed, Rick couldn't perform. He did try to be intimate with Libby on another occasion, but clearly he suffered from erectile dysfunction. His will didn't work. Rick was confused, as he had felt arousal many times before when performing sadistic rituals, torturing animals and lighting fires. He had even climaxed on several occasions. He thought that he didn't have enough blood in his body to pump it to his penis. This really got to him. He kept thinking about it, obsessing over it, and eventually he turned to drugs and alcohol. Rick spent all of his allowance on alcohol and drugs, and when he ran out, he would go into his neighbors' homes and steal liquor. Mind you, this was a time when doors were often left unlocked. He had this creepy thought that if a door was left unlocked and he could enter the home, it was an invitation. And he's going to repeat this behavior over and over again. Rick was getting more and more disheveled, not only mentally, but physically. He barely took care of basic hygiene. Finally, high school came to an end and Rick graduated with poor grades. At this point, Richard was ready for Rick to stand on his own two feet, get a job and move out. Beatrice, on the other hand, wanted him to go into higher education. After all, he had been a good student at one point. Rick chose the latter. School sounded far better than getting a job. In 1968, he enrolled at American River College. There, he would seek help from the college therapist. He would tell him about his erectile dysfunction, but omit the animal torment and setting fires. Rick also told him about his family and childhood. The therapist suggested the cause of his impotence was due to suppressed anger and mental illness. He could tell that parts of Rick's narrative was a blend of delusion and reality, but that he clearly wasn't stable. 
He had hatred for women when he spoke to Rick about this and said that Rick should mend things with Beatrice. Rick left his office and never returned. Rick would, however, go to the college healthcare center almost daily. His hypochondria was through the roof. He thought his heart was still shrinking and the blood in his body wasn't pumping. And he was often seen feeling himself looking for something foreign on his body. He was petrified that he would die and his appearance didn't get any better. Beatrice refused to notice the difference. She told people that Rick did not look any different from other kids of his generation. 60s, hippie era, all that. On top of this, his parents finally decided to divorce. Richard would move out and the children got to choose how to divide their time. Rick actually felt a way about this and did try to divide time between the parents equally. His father could clearly see what effort Rick was making to make both parents feel wanted. Mother Dearest, on the other hand, began to really mentally abuse Rick. She felt betrayed by her children. In her mind, she was the one who had been kind to them and never hurt them. She's fucking nuts. She was asking how he could spend time with the man who'd abused him and poisoned them their entire lives. The more she pushed, the more Rick got delusional. Uh, She finally cracked him. He wouldn't eat or drink when he was living with Richard, in fear that Richard had poisoned the food and the soap. Rick lost weight drastically. He now thought that the food at his mother's house was also poisoned. With little to no food and doing drugs and drinking alcohol, he got weaker and weaker. He would lay awake in bed, listening to his heart shrink. All of this obviously affected his studies and he ended up dropping out of college. It all culminated in him one day physically attacking Beatrice. She threw him out and Rick moved in with his father full time. Rick would be given routines such as keeping his room tidy and food shopping. He had a few odd jobs here and there, but he wasn't able to hold them for long like we are talking a few days, like that amount of time. In 1971, he found out about a vacant room for rent in a shared house. The two girls living there were acquaintances of his from his teen years. Now 21 years old, he moved in to Annandale Lane. Richard helped Rick move out, paid for rent, helped him with furniture and gave him an allowance. It all started off okay, but within just a few weeks, Rick started to talk to himself, continued to do drugs. Not only was he dirty and smelly, now he was walking around the house naked. He would even walk around naked when his roommates had people over. There were days when he was unresponsive and at night, odd sounds would come out from his bedroom, like hammering and banging. Not that kind of banging. He was actually turning his closet into some kind of a bunker and he would spend time there, even sleep there, so that whoever was after him couldn't hurt him. Rick was terrified that he was being followed and poisoned by odd entities. He hoarded magazines and books and he read up on all the weird conspiracy theories, such as UFOs. He thought that German soldiers living on the moon and aliens were communicating with him. For protection, he bought a 22 caliber gun, which he carried with him at all times. He even slept with this gun in his bunker. One evening, the two girls had people over. They were drinking, smoking, having a good time. Rick crawled out from his dwellings and joined the party. He had clothes on. He actually behaved, had a drink, mingled and acted normal. He lit up the room, almost literally. He went to the balcony, pulled out his gun and pointed it at people on the street, telling them, yeah, they better run. People left and the roommates were horrified, as any fucking sane person would be. They were scared of him, and the day after, they told Rick to leave. But Rick ignored them, stayed in his room, continued with his usual shitty behavior, even blaming them for wanting him to leave. And in May, three months after Rick moved in, the girls left. Back to Richard, he went. Richard wanted Rick to get a job again, and 
Rick was like, no, I'm not getting a job, but I would like a car. And his dad was like, listen, you're not studying. You don't work. You probably don't have friends after this last incident. So no, you're not getting a car. And they were arguing back and forth. And it got so bad that Rick went back to Beatrice. And yeah, everything was forgiven. Pamela, his sister, on the other hand, wasn't happy about this. She did not have good memories of him. Just chaos and how weird and spooky he had been her entire life. And now just looking at him freaked her out. She actually ran away from home. That's how little she wanted to be around her brother. Beatrice and Rick were egging each other on. He would continuously complain and go to the hospital even saying his stomach had been turned upside down and that his pulmonary artery had been removed. Now he thought the bones in his head were moving around. Beatrice told him that as a baby, his head had never fused together. Delusion mixed with drugs and a heavy amount of paranoia made life in the home unbearable. He would threaten Pamela and Beatrice, make animal sounds, talk in an unknown language, get naked, and sometimes just howl. Finally, Beatrice took out a loan, bought Rick the car he wanted, and gave him cash. He was delighted. He could finally take a road trip and explore himself. Um, and Rick left and no one knew where. However, a month later, he was arrested for drunk driving. The car was impounded. And because he was creepy as fuck, the other people in custody, police custody, didn't want to be around him and he was put into solitary confinement. When Richard picked him up, Rick told him how the guards had been poisoning him. That old spiel. Mm. Uh, and Rick went back to his mom. In 1973, at the age of 23, he was out roaming the streets. He met some of his old friends who invited him back to their house for a drink. After some time, the three guys left to buy more alcohol, and they left Rick alone with the only girl in the group. All of a sudden, he started badgering her. He forced himself on her, lying on top of her, grinding against her. When she got away, he ran after her, grabbing her and being a vile fucking predator. The guys came home and saw the chaos. And they were like, you need to leave. But he wouldn't. The victim was hiding in the bedroom crying. Rick kept on arguing and finally they threw him out. After a few minutes, he knocked on the door, claiming he'd forgotten his cigarettes. They let him in. He ranted and moved towards the bedroom where the girl was still hiding. A scuffle happened and his 22 caliber gun fell out. One of the guys kicked it away and the brawl continued. Neighbors had called the police at this point. The police came and took Rick away, but the guys didn't tell them about the gun. They didn't want to get Rick in too much trouble. And that's why Rick could get bail and was bailed by his father again the next day. Rick now thought he was a reincarnation of the outlaws in Jesse James's gang. He started adopting this frontier persona. He squeezed oranges on the top of his head, thinking his brain would absorb the vitamins better. He went to the hospital and they finally told him he had a mental illness. He got super offended and he actually claimed that he knew as much as the doctors and knew for a fact that there was nothing wrong with him mentally. Rick applied for welfare and because he looked like he looked, he got granted the money. He wasn't deemed fit enough to work. Richard and Beatrice had no idea about the welfare check. For Rick, the future looked bright. No way would he go back to the doctors that had claimed he had a mental illness. Such an insult. He would now cook his own food to avoid poisoning. He was active, tried to be healthier. He kept talking to himself but gained weight, started to look better and even showered. In his mind, he had developed a way to block the different entities from talking to him and reading his mind. He also thought that now that he was feeling better, it must have been Beatrice that had been poisoning him all these years. 
and one day he would attack her again, this time punching her in the face and knocking a tooth out. Later on that same day, Richard came over and told Rick that Rick would get his own apartment, under the condition that he didn't do drugs or Richard would stop paying his rent. Rick was now 25 years old and had his own apartment in Cannon Street. A bit run down, but he didn't care. The rent was paid and he was getting that welfare check. He went over to the guy's house where he had attacked the girl two years earlier. He told his former friend that his behavior was drug induced and he apologized. And his friend forgave him and gave him back the 22 caliber gun. At home, Rick would again collect conspiracy theory books and magazines. At one point, he tried to get in touch with the Hillside Stranglers, who he actually looked up to. If you know, you know. If you don't, good for you. He was eating better, but he couldn't let go of the delusion that he needed more blood in his body. Close to his new home was a rabbit farm. Rick looked around the farm, observed the rabbits, and then one day he went in and bought one. He went home, tortured it, enjoying the sounds and squeals of the poor rabbit. Then he slaughtered it, ate parts of it raw and drank its blood. He got aroused for the first time in years. He would keep buying rabbits, torture them, drain them of blood, but apart from the torture and drinking the blood, he would take the raw organs, put them in a blender, and drink them like a smoothie. Yes, he was drinking organ smoothies. He was feeling better, but now he wanted to optimize the energy from the blood. And one day, he took a syringe and injected himself with rabbit's blood. Instead of getting the kick he wanted, he got ill, very ill, fever, shivers, and delirium. Richard happened to come by and found Rick in this very bad way. Richard took him to the Sacramento Community Clinic where he was admitted to the emergency room. When Rick woke up, he thought he had died and that his heart had stopped. He told the doctors that he had eaten some bad rabbit and that the rabbit had contained battery acid. And the doctors obviously didn't believe him and they finally realized he had injected himself with animal blood. The doctors were convinced that Rick suffered from paranoid schizophrenia. With no access to blood or privacy, Rick immediately panicked. He got more delusional. He ranted and talked rubbish. The staff wanted to keep him there for two weeks. And on May 1976, conservatorship proceedings began and yep, it was given to Beatrice. She was now his legal guardian. On the second night, Rick ran away from the hospital, only to run to Richard, who would calm him down and take him for a drive. The drive would end up at Beverly Manor, a real hospital for people like Rick. This would be a secure ward for long-term treatment with psychotropic medication. The place was quiet and Rick liked it. He could walk around freely, he could go to the garden, and he could walk around indoors but he still didn't feel like his heart was beating correctly and again, the blood was disappearing from his body. After a while, Rick started openly talking about his obsession with blood, telling everyone around him how he'd tortured animals in every vile detail. Rick was found a few times with the blood on his face. It turned out that he would take the cafeteria bread into his room, put it on the windowsill to lure in birds. He would then catch them, bite off their heads and drink their blood. He was found in the garden in some freaking bushes with his face covered in blood. He'd captured small animals, killing them and again drinking their blood. One of the caretakers said, quote, Richard Chase is doing things with small animals and birds. You know, killing them, drinking their blood. And he will graduate to larger animals. And eventually to people. End quote. He got the nickname Dracula. The doctors diagnosed him with chronic paranoid schizophrenia and put him on medication. 
The medication eventually did start to work and he was improving. They thought he was ready to be released. And when the caretakers and nurses heard Rick was going to be released, they worried for the public. I didn't feel Richard was safe to be returned to society. He was sick and dangerous in my opinion. My professional opinion was that he needed much more further treatment and evaluation. It was even written in Rick's charts and the caretaker went to the head nurse, general manager, hospital administrator, a doctor and called the county conservator, but they did nothing. Beatrice found out what Rick had done and about the new nickname. As his legal guardian, she drove over there to Beverly Manor and she was happy to check Dracula out. Rick did get medication with him and was visiting the doctors on a regular basis so they could supervise him. Beatrice noticed that Rick was coherent, didn't talk to himself and seemed semi-normal. She still did not want to live with him, so she arranged for Rick to move into the Watt apartment complex. For months he lived like your everyday person. He went to the doctors routinely so that they could be sure the medication was working. And it was. His mind had calmed down. It was almost quiet in his head. And then, just then, Beatrice decided Rick didn't need his medication anymore. According to her, there was nothing wrong with him mentally. So why take pills and act like a zombie? She started to wean Rick off the medication. Rick grabbed this opportunity and decided to take a trip to celebrate his newfound freedom. Beatrice agreed and gave him a couple of thousand dollars and off he went on his road trip. Rick bought a 1966 Ford Ranchero. The trip lasted for about a month. When he came back to Sacramento, now off all medication and not having any contact with the doctors, he sank back into the old delusions. His neighbors later reported that they had seen Rick take cats and dogs into the apartment and the animals were never seen again. Indeed, he was purchasing abandoned and mistreated dogs for $15 from the local animal shelter. Like, just, what kind of, why aren't you telling anyone? Like you see this creepy ass dude taking animals into his apartment, small apartment at that, and you never see the animals again. And same with the rabbit farm. Like this guy's coming over, buying animals over and over again, and you're not questioning what's going on. Like what the fuck? I'd be so pissed because he's going to go and kill people. I would be so pissed if all these signs are like, like society failed the victims. That's all I'm saying. Anyways. Meanwhile, Beatrice was living her best life. Rick was out in the world, not causing her any trouble. She now had a German shepherd puppy and was feeding stray cats. One day in early summer of the same year, Beatrice came home to find her puppy mutilated and killed. Rick stood there, blood on his face and hands. Beatrice did nothing. She didn't want to show him any emotion. He then left. They didn't talk for weeks, and then he turned up at her front door with one of the cats she'd been feeding. The cat was still alive, but he killed it then and there. He ripped it apart in front of her, smeared the blood all over his face. She closed the door on him and continued on with her life. In August, he was arrested at Pyramid Lake after reports of a parked car in a Native American reservation. Inside the dirty truck, police found apparel, weapons, and a container with blood and a liver in it. The two officers used their binoculars and spotted Rick on the top of a hill. And when Rick saw the officers approach him, he ran. They caught up to him. He was covered in blood, naked. When they asked where the blood came from, he said... It was his blood seeping out from his body. He was taken to custody, put in a cell. It turned out that Rick had gutted a cow, stolen some of its organs and drained some of its blood. And because it was an animal organ in the bucket, he was released once again to Richard. Back at the apartment, he kept buying dogs and stealing them. The neighborhood pet owners would put up missing dog and cat posters. 
and Rick would sometimes call them and tell them in every gruesome detail what he had done to their beloved pets. The police couldn't do anything because there was no evidence that the caller wasn't just pranking the poor owners. Christmas was coming up, but Rick was banned from spending the holidays with the family. Rick would later say that this was the trigger that made him do what he did. Things would now escalate from animals to humans. He wanted to drink human blood. Animal blood wasn't doing it for him. He also started thinking drinking animal blood was beneath him. On the 29th of December of 1976, five months after killing his mom's puppy, Rick was driving around the neighborhood. He stopped at the Robertson Avenue and spotted a man carrying a bag of groceries in his driveway. This man was Ambrose Griffin, a 51-year-old husband and father of two. Without hesitation, Rick fired his gun twice, hitting Mr. Griffin, who instantly fell to the ground, and Rick drove off. Unfortunately, there wasn't much blood at the crime scene and people thought Mr. Griffin had a heart attack, but later on in the hospital, they realized that he had been fatally shot. Bullet shells were found, but the investigation led nowhere. Although Rick hadn't been able to drink the blood of Mr. Griffin, he felt a rush, a bigger rush than torturing animals. The next couple of days, he would roam the neighborhood entering homes that were left unlocked. He entered the house of the Edward family. No one was at home. He started rummaging through their belongings. He went from room to room and found a nursery. He defecated in the baby's crib, wiping himself with a baby blanket, and then he urinated in the drawers. This was when the family of three returned. Rick fled quickly because he's a fucking coward. Mr. Edwards ran after him, but Rick got away. Rick wasn't done for the day, and around noon, he made his way to a supermarket near his house. Nancy Holden, a former acquaintance of Rick's from high school, was shopping there at the same time. He went up to her like, Hi, weren't you the girl that sat on Kurt's motorcycle when he died? Kurt had been Nancy's former boyfriend who had died in a motorcycle accident, but she tried to figure out who this stinking, skinny, dirty person was. She asked him, who are you? He replied, Rick. He then turned around and walked off. After a while, he came back and started making small talk. He then asked where she was going. She said to the bank because she worked there. At this point, she just wanted to get away from his breath stench and the yellow crust on his face. Her words, not mine. After she paid, she quickly left the store and got into her car. Rick went after her yelling, hey, wait. She didn't wait. On the 23rd of January, Rick was doing his typical roaming around the neighborhood looking for unlocked doors. He found one at 2360 Tioga Way and wearing gloves, he entered the home of the Walling family. Unfortunately, 22-year-old Teresa Wallin, who was three months pregnant, was home alone. Rick scared her in the hallway. Teresa threw her hands in front of her face. Rick pulled the trigger, hitting his victim in one hand. He then shot her through her jaw, and as she lay on the floor, he shot her through her temple. He then dragged her to a bedroom, went to the kitchen, and retrieved a knife, and started to cut into her, starting with the belly, which he completely opened up. He took out the intestines. He then continued cutting the organs, liver, pancreas, and kidneys. Court documents read, oddments of a three-month-old fetus were also found. He then cut off her nipple and drank her blood. He got a yogurt cup from the bin and collected blood in it and drank even more. He then ended it all in the most deranged, heinous, disgusting way. He went to the backyard, found dog feces, came back in and put it in Teresa's mouth. He then washed himself off, put the knife back in the kitchen and went back home to watch TV. Teresa's husband, David, would find his beautiful wife in a state that would destroy anyone, Not only did this creature kill his wife, he also killed his unborn child. 
The bullet shells at the Wallin home matched those at the Griffin crime scene. Neighbors had seen Rick wandering in the area trying to enter houses, and a description had been given to the police. Two days after killing Teresa Wallin, Rick stole a Labrador puppy from a neighbor, which he tortured and killed. He then left the dead dog in the neighbor's front yard for them to find. On the 27th of January, Rick committed his final murders. He entered the home of 38-year-old Evelyn Miroth, who was at home babysitting her 22-month-old nephew, David. Evelyn's six-year-old son, Jason, and Evelyn's friend, Dan Meredith, were out shopping for winter clothes. He found Evelyn in the hallway. He shot her once in the head. Baby David got scared, and the baby started crying in his crib. Rick shot the baby at point-blank range in the face. He died immediately. Rick used two knives in this attack to mutilate his victims. He took baby David to the bathroom and carved out brain matter through the bullet wound and started eating some of the brain. He dragged Evelyn's body onto a bed. He then sodomized the body. Rick had now committed necrophilia. He then started to mutilate it. He made a cut at the back and at the front of the neck and drank her blood. He stabbed her at least half a dozen times in the private area, the knife penetrating her uterus. He stabbed her in vital points of the body. The blood pulled in the belly and he drained it into a bucket. He then consumed all of it, all of the blood, and tried to cut out one of Evelyn's eyes. Court documents. Eight cuts to the neck. Six cuts to the uterus. Cuts to the rectum. Knife thrust back and forth in wound. Right eye pulled out of socket. Unfortunately, six-year-old Jason and family friend Dan Meredith came home during this macabre act. Rick shot Dan in the face, took his car keys and wallet and went after six-year-old Jason and shot him in the face twice. Jason would later be found on the floor next to the bed where his mother Evelyn lied. Rick fled the scene in Dan's car and took the body of baby David with him. Back at his apartment, he removed the baby's head from the body, drank his blood and ate some more of the baby's brain. The police were on high alert now. They wanted to find baby David. Many of them suspected the baby wasn't alive anymore, but they needed to find him. The murders were so random that the clues didn't give much about who the killer was. People were obviously panicking because this killer seemed to pick his victims randomly. Neighbors spoke to the authorities about this random, dirty, disheveled, unkept man that had been seen around in the neighborhood and backyards for months trying to enter homes. He was described as a white male, around six feet tall, wearing an orange parka, scruffy mustache and beard, and dirty, messy hair. FBI agents made a profile of the offender, a profile that pretty much described Rick down to a T. Again, it was the 70s, people looked a certain way, but this time the police would make a sketch. A day after the murders, Nancy Holden, the woman from the store, saw the sketch of Rick and went to the police. They ran a background check on Richard Rick Chase and things started to emerge. Things like the odd incident at Pyramid Lake with the cow. Now they had a suspect and his address. They rushed to the apartment. They heard Rick move inside, so they banged on the door, but he didn't open. The police didn't have a warrant at the time, so they couldn't go in. They had no real physical evidence, so getting a warrant would take some time. As happens, they waited and Rick came outside holding a box. And when he saw the cops, he started running. He got tackled to the ground and he was taken into custody. The box contained bloodied, dirty rags. He had his 22 caliber Luger on him and Dan's wallet in his back pocket. The police described the horror of the apartment. The stench of rotting flesh, there was blood everywhere. On the countertops, floor, walls, blood-covered containers. In the fridge, 
jars of different concoctions containing organs, animal, and human. Rick's blender contained not only human and animal organs, but Coca-Cola. He was drinking blood and organ Coca-Cola smoothies. There were many cat and dog collars, but no baby David. The arresting officer interrogated Rick, and he admitted to killing dogs, but nothing else. He rambled on about German soldiers, UFOs, but made no further confession. Two months later, in March, not even a mile from Rick's home, the remains of baby David were found in a cardboard box behind the Arcade Wesleyan Church. The head had been removed from the body, but all the remains were there. The trial started in late 1979, and Rick's lawyer tried to plead insanity for his client. He also said that he was the most deranged felon he'd ever met. The prosecution didn't believe this at all. They said Rick knew right from wrong. They pointed out that he wore gloves at the crime scenes to hide what he had done and not to get caught. The first witness in the trial was David Wallin, who described the scene of horror he had encountered, finding his pregnant wife murdered. Rick took the stand in his own defense. He weighed 107 pounds, or 48 kilos. His eyes were all sunken in, and he looked like shit. He claimed to have been semi-conscious during the Wallin murder, and he admitted to drinking Wallin's blood. He told the court about his awful childhood. He also claimed he didn't remember much about the Mirath murders, but knew that he had shot the baby in the head and decapitated him leaving him in a bucket in the hope of getting more blood out of the baby. He pled insanity. It took the jury only five hours to deliberate, and on May 9th, at the age of 29, Richard Rick Chase was sentenced to death, and the method would be the gas chamber. The fellow inmates, aware of Rick's graphic, vile, and bizarre murders, feared him, and they often told him to commit suicide. In prison, he spoke to one of the FBI agents and said that he had been stalked by the German soldiers and aliens and that they had forced him to kill. He yet again claimed that the prison guards were poisoning him. Oh, and he also said that he was a good person. He would come bearing gifts for the FBI agent, like mac and cheese he'd been hiding in his pockets. Yummy. In December 1980, the day after Christmas, only seven months after the sentencing, a guard found Rick lying awkwardly on his bed, not breathing. Richard Rick Chase had committed suicide with an overdose of antidepressants he had hoarded over weeks. And that was an easy way to go. Easy compared to a gas chamber. He just, ugh, nothing went right with this story. Absolutely nothing. And that was the end of that horrid story. Thank you for watching my video and I hope I'll see you soon. Bye.